Live from KSAT 12, the night beat starts right now. New research shedding light on who's behind the majority of misinformation surrounding the COVID-19 vaccine. And now a new claim about a wave of sickness is put through the KSAT Trust Index. It's coming up plus. Let's get out, let's get to voting and make District 2 one of the brightest shining lights in the city of San Antonio. We have to bring people in, even if they didn't support you originally, and that's entirely my plan. We are down to two candidates in District 2, both city council candidates hoping to grab the attention of voters in tonight's debate ahead of early voting. It's coming up, but first. A restaurant owner walking back vaccine requirements for employees after receiving some backlash. A leaked memo on Reddit is what got everyone's attention. The memo stated that costs related to COVID wouldn't be covered if an unvaccinated person got sick. The night team's Jonathan Cotto is in Bernie with the story. Guy Sanders, owner of Richter Tavern in Bernie, catching heat after this memo he shared with his employees ended up on Reddit. Everything that goes wrong, it always starts with the best intentions. Someone with the username Hike the Sky posted it online yesterday. The memo stated that if an employee gets sick with COVID-19 and isn't vaccinated, the cost of the test would be docked from their pay. They would also be required to stay home for 10 days without pay. I made the decision that after the vaccine was available, that I would no longer be paying for people to get sick since there's a, a free vaccine available. Sanders says as a small business owner, he's tried to take care of his staff during the pandemic. During the height of the pandemic, anytime uh, an employee needed testing, uh, I would pay for testing. Sanders said he would also pay COVID positive employees a stipend while they recovered at home. Something that Shane Alahi, who has been working at the restaurant for more than a year, says she is grateful for. Restaurant industry does not provide medical. It's, it's very rare that you would see a restaurant of any kind offer employee benefits. Sanders says he has received threatening phone calls. Commenters who didn't agree with the memo said they would boycott the restaurant and that the restaurant should be sued. It was taken uh, to the extreme by the anti-vaccine population and they came after me in droves. Employees receiving the same threats. Unfair, unfair society right now. I mean, it just takes one person to post one thing on Facebook and it just goes crazy insane and um, it's totally not fair to us. Totally not fair to the owners, not fair to us as the employees because we love this place. Sanders says he's ready to move forward. We're here to service uh, the Bernie communities and, and San Antonio community, and that's all I want to do. I don't want to be talking about vaccines. I don't want to be talking about COVID. I want to be making great food and creating great experiences. Sanders has since rescinded that memo. He says he'll be paying for all of his employees' medical costs to vaccinated or not. Reporting live, Jonathan Cotton, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jonathan. It is a district that's changed hands regularly in recent city council elections. It is unclear if that trend will continue in District 2 this year. Incumbent Jada Andrews Sullivan and challenger Jalen McKee Rodriguez both taking the stage tonight in a debate ahead of the runoff election. McKee Rodriguez able to grab 26% of the vote in the May election, while Andrew Sullivan had 17% of the vote, neither enough to win the race outright. Tonight, both took to the debate stage at Dominion Church on MLK Drive. Andrew Sullivan saying her focus is on development in District 2. Development that is not brought to the city and brought to the community without them seeing it happen. Um, we need to change the structure of how we're doing development. And so that's what really sticks out. And meanwhile, when McKee Rodriguez was asked the same question, he did not speak on a particular topic, only that change is needed. When we're knocking on doors, people are passionate, people are upset, people are angry. They want a change. They don't know what that change always is. Some people want bold, progressive change. Everybody wants bold change, and that comes with new leadership. Along with District 2, there are several other runoff races taking place. Voters will head back to the polls to decide city council races in districts 1, 3, 5, and 9. Early voting begins on Monday, Election Day, June 5th. We have all your election coverage right now on KSAT.com. Well, they worked line by line. Thieves managed to go undetected as they stole 50 catalytic converters from dozens of vehicles on a lot 
near San Pedro. Those, those suspects working under the cover of darkness early this morning when traffic was minimal. Take a listen to what the damaged inventory sounds like without their catalytic converters. As we have reported, these converters are targeted because of the precious metals inside. Those thieves then turn them into cash by selling them on the black market. The co-owner of this Mitsubishi dealership on San Pedro says he hired security after hearing about similar thefts at dealerships in Dallas and Austin. The security form firm for that San Antonio lot was set to start tomorrow. To, for it to happen a day before we engaged the security company was just, you know, disheartening. I mean, it, it, it was bad. Co-owner Islam Hindash says San Antonio police have surveillance video of the two men in the dealership lot that he hopes will help lead to some clues. As we have reported, some companies are providing products that may protect catalytic converters. We have all those details on KSAT.com. When it comes to the vaccine rollout, we are nearing a major milestone. More than 995,000 people have at least one dose of vaccine in Bear County. That number expected to hit 1 million by Monday. But when it comes to full vaccinations, 44.6% of people 12 and up have both doses of vaccine. We continue to see a drop in the average number of COVID-19 cases. The seven day rolling average now at 138 cases per day. One new death reported 154 COVID-19 patients are in the hospital. A lot of lessons have been learned in this pandemic year. As rural districts wrap up a stressful COVID-19 school year, they say they are more than glad to put it behind them. The night team's Patty Santos takes us to Somerset ISD, where families can expect a normal start to the school year in the fall. Scared, very scared, because there's no vaccinations. Tanya Juarez echoes what many parents felt at the start of the school year. If she could go back in time, she'd tell herself not to stress. You can get through this. Be patient. It will be over soon. Somerset ISD families are elated to have a very different end of the school year. We're in a, a much better place today as we started off the school year. With only one week left, life is almost back to normal, says Superintendent Saul Hinojosa. In-person learning is at 83% now compared to 38% in the fall. Their roughest patch for infections was after the winter break when 54 students tested positive. We were able to uh, get that number down. Uh, to uh, just last week, I believe we had uh, two positives uh, in 2,500 tests. So uh, we have not had more than five or six in the last three months. And he says having COVID testing available early on and now vaccination drives have really helped them get infection rates under control. I feel more comfortable with Somerset because they did test them. The pandemic helped change the way teachers teach, where now all students have Chromebooks and it illuminated the disparities in Internet access. So we are trying to address that, meeting with local officials to try to improve that uh, in our district. And the superintendent says next year, all students will be back to in-person learning. COVID testing will also continue through the summer, and there's talk right now that it may also continue into the start of next school year. 250 seniors will graduate from school in a week from tomorrow. Steve Isis. Thank you, Patty. Fiesta's famous night in old San Antonio is keeping the pandemic in mind. Tickets are limited to reduce crowding and those tickets will only be sold online. Meanwhile, NIOSA is also following CDC guidance, meaning those who are fully vaccinated will not be required to wear masks. Those who do not have the vaccine are asked to mask up and be aware the event will use a cashless pay system. We have all the details as well as a link for NIOSA tickets on ksat.com. And just a reminder, 900 doses of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine will be made available at a Fiesta-themed vaccine clinic this weekend. No appointment is necessary, and Fiesta medals will also be handed out. The clinic will be happening at the 2600 block or 26 Plaza building on Southwest Military Drive from 9 in the morning to 12 in the afternoon this coming Saturday. It is another step forward in the latest attempt to revamp the old Lone Star Brewery site. City Council approving a multi-million dollar incentive. Depending on how much is done and how quickly, developers could be reimbursed as much as $24 million. Demolition work expected to begin later this year. 
This will be the fourth time crews will try and transform the site near Southtown. Gray Street Partners and Midway will tackle the area in a series of phases. They've said the first phase will focus on building a mixed use project with retail, restaurants, bars and apartments. Well, they're called the disinformation dozen. Just 12 people who are responsible for posting the majority of hoaxes and false information online about the COVID vaccine. Coming up, who these 12 people are, and we fact check a new claim surrounding the vaccine. Our trust index is coming up next. The prevalence of disinformation online has erupted in recent years with topics covering everything from elections to COVID taking center stage. A recent study by the Center for Countering Digital Hate found that when it comes to false or misleading information about the COVID-19 vaccine, only 12 people are responsible for about 65% of all vaccine hoaxes on social media. The group calls these 12 people the disinformation dozen and the list includes influencers, entrepreneurs, and well-known anti-vaxxers like Robert F. Kennedy Jr. as part of the study. Hundreds of thousands of Facebook and Twitter posts were analyzed and found that the majority of anti-vaccine content originates with just these 12 people. The group is calling on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter to remove the disinformation dozen for spreading disinformation and therefore violating their terms of service agreements. Which brings us to a viewer question that we received from Cecilia here. Cecilia asked, are fully vaccinated people going to comprise the third wave of sickness and death? Cecilia went on to tell us that she saw this in an article by freelance writer Leo Homan, this one right here, and she asked us to look into it. In tonight's Trust Index report, we take her question and this article to the experts. The headline reads, third wave of sickness and death will be dominated by those who have been fully vaccinated. Citing a British study, the article goes on to claim that the next big wave of COVID infections is already hitting some parts of the U.S. Dr. Brian Alsip, chief medical officer at University Health, sets the record straight. So I think it's pretty misleading. Uh, for for a lot of folks. It's, uh, I think, two paragraphs out of their multi-page uh, modeling study. And frankly, it, it doesn't match with any data that we're seeing here in the United States um, and certainly not in San Antonio. Dr. Alsip says the study cited in the article was not actually based on any data, but rather were projections or models that ultimately did not pan out. As for the article, local epidemiologist Dr. Sharice Roar Allegrini says it contains many red flags. The article is written in typical anti-vax propaganda rhetoric. She goes on to say there's no virus in the vaccine, and if COVID continues to spread, vaccines aren't the cause of that. It's completely 100% impossible to spread the virus from the vaccine. It means that you have a new infection and the vaccine isn't working as well as we hoped it would. To date, we don't have enough evidence to suggest that is actually happening. What's actually happening, according to Dr. Alsip, is that most of the patients dying or in the hospital with COVID are people who have not been vaccinated. So to answer our viewer question about whether fully vaccinated people will drive a third wave of sickness and death, our trust index rates this one as not true. Now, if you have a question or piece of content you'd like us to fact check, you can submit it by going to ksat.com slash trust index. All right, take a look at this. Sometimes I do silly things for great causes. That's me on the right wearing a wreath on my head. <laughs> it was to raise money for Alpha Home, a nonprofit addiction treatment center for women. Actor, producer Daniel Baldwin spoke about his addiction battle. Great guy, great event. Thank you for everyone that took place, took part in it. And if you are curious about Alpha Home, you can check out their website at alphahome.org. Well, we, we Steve, did you accidentally call him his brother's name? <laughs> I did. Uh, okay, so that was my fear that I would call Daniel Baldwin one of the other Baldwin brothers, and I got to the very oh, end of the no. program, and I said, and thank you to our keynote speaker, Billy Baldwin. Oh, no. And I realized what I did, and then I said, I mean Alec Baldwin. I mean Stephen Baldwin. Perfect. I mean Daniel. So I just went through them all. There you played go. it off. Nice. I played yeah. it, yeah. Meantime, let's take a live look outside. Alamo looking pretty out there.
Yeah, it is for sure. Yeah. Beautiful day today. Quiet day today. We're not going to see a big change tomorrow, but rain chances start to creep their way back into the forecast. The new drought monitor is out and I'm excited to share that with you. We have the NOAA hurricane outlook and then weekend rain chances. A lot to get you. We're starting with the good news. Take a look at three weeks ago. Look at all the red on that drought monitor indicating the extreme and exceptional drought. Here we go. Three, two, one. And now look at the changes this week and keep in mind, even though we wiped away a good portion of the extreme drought and even the severe drought, this does not take into account the good rainfall that we had yesterday and even Tuesday night. So next week's is going to be even better and we're going to add a little bit of more rain to it where we really need the rain, obviously part of our neck of the woods and farther south, uh, but also West Texas and parts of the Western Panhandle really need the moisture and they're not getting it right now. We're actually tracking the tr tropics here. And by the way, the National Hurricane Center does say there's a 60% chance, 6D percent chance of a slightly above average hurricane season. So that would be about uh, about 13 to 20 named storms out there of those about half a dozen hurricanes. And we're tracking this little area in the Gulf right now. Very weak right now, not a big deal. It's just a lot of moisture, but it's one of those things where it's got a little bit of a center circulation. So the hurricane centers even a 20% chance of developing into something. It's one of the main players in our weather. It's actually this big dip in the upper level flow, this trough, that big ripple. And it's helping to really keep that moving and keep that going. And what this is doing too, it's acting as a conveyor belt of moisture from the Gulf of Mexico all the way up into Canada. That's the way the flow is right now. That conveyor belt of moisture will start to push westward slowly tomorrow and on into the weekend. So here's what that means for our rain chances. Friday, 30%. That's mainly afternoon and evening, a few pop-up showers and thunderstorms. Saturday, we're up to 40%, especially the second half of the day. Sunday, 60%. I think we'll have the best coverage on Sunday. Now that said, the odds of severe weather, very, very low, very slim over the next several days. And even Friday and Saturday, most of it's going to be east of I-35. The closer you are to the Rio Grande, your rain chances are even lower. Let's talk temperatures. 59 this morning, well below average, then 85 for the high temperature. Right now we're still 80 in Catula, 83 Del Rio, but 70s elsewhere. It's nice outside, just a little muggy with dew points in the 60s. And that's going to limit us to temperatures in the 60s tomorrow morning. So you'll wake up to 68 Canyon Lake, 68 in Beeville, and 68 in Hondo. Here in San Antonio, about 66 in the morning. By the afternoon, near 90 and in the lower 90s along the Rio Grande, you get to downtown, 86, Converse 85, Timberwood Park 83, and Bernie at 82. Morning fog to start the day, so anticipate some reduced visibility to start the day tomorrow, then partly cloudy, making it to 84 for the high temperature. And over the weekend, high temperatures mostly right near 80 degrees. And then next week, it's back to 90 by the middle of the week. All right, thanks so much, Adam. All right, if you look on the bright side for the San Antonio Spurs, they're going to have a lottery pick. Depending on the free agents they keep, they could have a lot of cap room. Well, they will have a lot of cap room. There's no question about that. And there are three big-name free agents are coming out of the Spurs this summer. When we come back, we'll name those four, including DeMar DeRozan. And Ezekiel Elliott's dog bites two people. What happened? Got it for you coming up. Unique roller coaster. Weird, uh, you know, um, I think them three things that definitely sums up the season. <laughs> That's how DeMar DeRozan sums up the Spurs season that ended last night in Memphis in Big Board Sports. Now that the Spurs season is officially over, following their 196 loss to the Grizzlies in Memphis in their first ever playing game, the big question now is who will be back next season? The biggest name on that list is DeMar DeRozan, just completed his third season in silver and black as the team's leading scorer and is now an unrestricted free agent. That's after he was sent to the Spurs in that forced Kawhi Leonard trade that included Danny Green in exchange for DeRozan and Jakob Pertl back in the summer of 2018. But DeMar is not the only one. Rudy Gay's two-year $32 million deal is done. Patty Mills, the last member of the two 2014 championship team is also a free agent this offseason. Following last night's loss, DeMar was asked if he thought about returning to the Silver and Black in the city of San Antonio. I've never been in this situation before in my career to, to be going 
you know, completely in as a free agent. I have no clue. I, it hasn't been something I thought about or ponder about or I could sit up here and say, you know, I got options. This, you know, it's just, you know, I'm still um, thinking about how we could have won, how we could have kept playing. So many emotions, you know, just with these guys and, you know, having to go sit on the plane with those guys and, you know, try to keep them upbeat. Um, understanding that, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely a learning curve and, this is something that 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 could build build you up for the long run in your career. So you know that's that's my focus right now. Just trying to keep these guys head up, be positive um, as much as it sucks right now. Now this is the first time in Spurs franchise history they have lost out of the playoffs in back-to-back -back seasons. That's after 22 straight of making the postseason under head coach Greg Popovich and going all the way back to the 96-97 season, the last time the Spurs were not in the postseason, which led to the Spurs winning the draft lottery, the number one pick, and in the NBA, which of course they selected Tim Duncan in five championships later, worked out quite well. Everything this team went through this season, losing Derek White more than once and having to get through the COVID quarantine that forced the Spurs to play 40 games in 68 days in the second half of the season, but still had a shot at the postseason with the play-in tournament. I don't know if I've ever been more proud of a team that just doesn't quit. Uh, no matter what the mistakes, no matter uh, what the circumstances are, uh, they really fight, and that's a good base. I'm proud of it. Uh, win, lose, or draw. Uh, good game, bad games, no matter what. You know, uh, I'm with my team, you know, forever. Uh, we never got a Spurs jersey on. You know, uh, with my brothers, uh, you know, I'm always proud of just the fight. You know, that's just especially for myself. You know, I was raised that way. You know, fight, fight until you can't breathe no more. So, uh, you know, of course, I'm proud of us. Uh, obviously, I'm not proud of the outcome, you know, of us going home tonight. But, you know, at the end of the day, I'm proud of my team always. Congratulations to Wagner grad Jordan Clarkson. He's one of three finalists for the NBA Sixth Man of the Year Award released today. He, along with Jazz teammate Joe Ingles and Derek Rose of the Knicks, are up for the postseason honor. Clarkson averaged a career-high 18.4 points per game for the Jazz this season. High school baseball playoffs next. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Dallas Cowboys star running back Ezekiel Elliott has been issued three citations by Frisco police after three of his dogs were loose and one of his dogs bit two people, sent them to the hospital. This all happened this morning in Starwood neighborhood. One of the dogs of Rottweiler is now in a 10 day quarantine. This is not the first time Zeke's dogs have caused problems. In June of 2020, a woman pool attendant filed a lawsuit against Elliott after she claimed three dogs attacked her at his home in March of 2020, causing serious bodily injury. The high school baseball playoffs, class 6A third round in the ISD sports complex as a Smithson Valley Rangers hosting the Reagan Rattlers. Game one in their series, top of the second. The Rattlers have the bases loaded. Aiden Coleman hits a chopper to second, but it's good enough to get Britton Moore across the plate for the first run of the game. Reagan not done. Cole Tabor lays down the textbook butt to bring home Satan Ankrum. The Rattlers would lead grow until to three until the fourth inning. The Rangers' David De Hoyas putting his bat to good use with a line drive to center field. Casey Wells scores from second. The Rangers are on the board and the, force the extra innings and win it four to three and eight. Game two tomorrow to the third round of the playoffs in class four A. The Navarro Panthers facing the Canyon Lake Hawks in game one of the series at NEISD Sports Complex. First inning, bases full of the Hawks. Matthew McClain at the plate and the pitch is wide and pegs him right in the back. He'd be fine. Kane Lake gets on the board. Still in the first. It's 2 0. Tanner Schultz hits into a fielder's choice, but that allows Chase Anderson to score. Hawks take a 3 0 lead, and that is the final. Canyon takes game one, 3 0. Game two is tomorrow at 4 30 at NEISD. So a lot of baseball players still continuing on. A lot of teams involved. We'll have more coverage tomorrow night. Thank you, Greg. You're welcome. We'll be right back. <laughs> Here's a full look at that uh, NOAA 2021 hurricane forecast for the Atlantic Basin. About 13 to 20 named storms, slightly above average there. Hurricanes would be about 6 to 10, and of those 6 to 10, potentially 3 to 5 major hurricanes. So a 60% chance of a slightly above average season. Rain chances creep back into the picture, but they start to accelerate a little bit more toward the end of the weekend. Thank you, Adam. Good morning, San Antonio starts at 4.30. Good night.